And that was it. There were things that I was introduced to in that course where I was like, why has this never been told to me before? Why have I never been introduced to this way of thinking or this way of planning my dives? Off Gassing, a scuba podcast with host Nick Hogel. For some, diving becomes more than a hobby. It becomes a lifelong passion. Jordan Allard first became certified when he was 10 years old and he has been chasing breaths underwater ever since. I sit down and speak with Jordan about his progression through the sport, which eventually led him to teaching with global underwater explorers. The wide range of diving conditions in the UK, shipwrecks of the UK, advice on dry suits, why he chose to pursue a path with GUE, and some misconceptions one might have about GUE training and their standards. Please enjoy. Jordan, how are you doing this morning? I am doing very well. Thank you ever so much for having me on, Nick. Um, an absolute pleasure on my behalf. I'm, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm uh, happy to get chatting. Yeah, yeah. No. So where exactly are you right now? So I'm still currently in the UK. This is where I tend to spend most of my winters. It's purely one, a little bit of downtime, but it's also nice catching up with a few of the individuals that I dive with uh, over here in the, my little home country. Okay. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, it's currently 9 a.m. over there for you, correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's always it's always a little bit weird, not weird, but a little bit weird for the, the different time zones, just because it's like, you know, I'll be speaking to somebody as they're waking up and starting their day and I'm ready to end my day or vice versa. And it's just always kind of adds to a uh, adds a nice little dynamic to the conversation sometimes. But thank God for technology, right? <laughs> we can be in this room together. <laughs> The marvels of what we have at our fingertips today. I suppose it's always good fun for you trying to work out the timings. I've got my coffee here, so I'm good to rock and roll, mate. Awesome, awesome. So I will jump right in. And the first question that I always like to ask is, tell me about how and why you got into scuba diving. Tell me about that first breath, that first experience, what led to it, what the diving was like. Just tell me all about it, man. Okay, cool. So my fascination with the underwater world has oof, been around as long as I can really remember. I was never the kid to uh, go home and watch cartoons. I was like Nat Geo, Discovery Channel, Deadly 60, The Crocodile Hunter with Steve Irwin. I was so obsessed with nature. And then when I got exposure to, right, you can now start diving underwater, I was like, this is something that I really have to do. It was like top of my list. So I done a try dive in a pool when I was nine in Spain. And I think it was that silence, that immersion, that almost blissfulness in like just the weightless state. I was like, okay, I need more of this. And it was always on the forefront of my mind whenever I was away, I was like, I have to go diving. So I went uh, <laughs> with my family on a uh, holiday to a Mark Warner's location over in Sardinia, and they predominantly do uh, water sports activities. And there was a dive center there that were running tri dives. So straight away, that was it. I was signing up. I was hooked. And then they said, oh, we're actually running a uh, open water class after this. And if anyone's interested in signing up, uh, by all means, um, come speak to us about it. And we can talk about um, how the class is laid out. So I looked beady eyed at my parents. I was like, please, I really, really, really want to do this. And they were a little bit hesitant. They were like, okay, you're 10. It's a lot of classroom work. It's a lot of academic stuff that's going on. Are you sure you're going to want to spend your holiday doing this? And there was no hesitation from me. Um, what's really funny is a few years later, uh, they actually turned around and went, yeah, we never thought you were going to finish the class. We thought you were going to get bored and pull out. So that was it. I was... <laughs> I was absolutely glued to the hip of the instructor. I was like every morning, first person by the pool, first person in the classroom. Um, and I came away with my um, open water diver and every opportunity, it didn't matter where I was. I was either in the south of the UK, I was in Turkey, I was in Spain. I was anywhere where I could go diving. I was just always outside the dive center ready to to waddle off with my little 10 litre cylinder because I was so small at the time I couldn't carry anything bigger <laughs> and that just led me down the path where I was so interested in knowing more and exploring more that I um, 
ended up interning as a dive master in the south of the UK, straight out of my A levels, which would be sort of like the end of your high school. So I was I'm an R in with uh, college and university opportunities. I was looking at like marine biology, uh, zoology, and other things, and. The dive center said, look, why don't you come and finish your intern here, become an instructor, and you can kind of, you know, take the degree as you are, as you move along. Anyway, the degree kind of fell on the, uh, on, on the back burner on the wayside. And I ended up being in that dive center seven days a week, purely starting as a volunteer. And then when I saw a little bit of money coming in my back pocket, I was like, okay, cool. I'm really going to dedicate <laughs> a huge part of my time to this. And I started seeing a career for myself form in front of me. So 18, I was pretty much full-time. And as you get more exposure in the uh, industry and you start getting new things introduced to you, it was, right, it's time for me to jump into a twin set. So I started twin set diving, started taking some of my technical uh, classes. Uh, then it was on to CTR. And by the time I was 21, 22, I was uh, teaching twin set diving and moving to actually um, becoming a CCR instructor. So it was a little bit pushed and condensed. I do, uh, I do understand and see that now, but I was so headstrong and sort of dedicated to where I wanted to go in my career that it just kept moving. Now I'm 27. Um, I've kind of, what I say, experienced quite a lot in my uh, diving career. I've literally just this past September, um, completed my fundamentals IE, or sorry, my GUE um, fundamentals and Rec 1 IE. So I'm now uh, teaching under the GUE banner. Um, I also have got a little bit of TDI and SDI instructing under my belt. And predominantly before this, I was teaching all through SSI. So I have purely aimed to make a career for myself um, in, in diving, which has not been easy. It's had a had a few hurdles placed in its way, but I, uh, I'm i still really striving for it and I'm hoping to, uh, you know, have uh, quite a long and bountiful career <laughs> in this industry. Oh, no, that's awesome, man. So I, I just want to bring it back just a little bit. So when you were, after you completed your open water and then you said you, you went into a dive master program, like every chance you got pretty much after that open water course, were you like, okay, what's the next class I could take? What's the next class? And then it eventually led to the dive master. I'm like, cause usually I'm assuming it was the traditional, just advanced open water rescue dive master type progression. Yeah. So that's how I started. I took a lot of specialities as I was moving through. So from the age of like 10 up to 15, and uh, I kind of balanced that out where it was a little bit of just kind of uh, gaining experience and just going and enjoying diving, which for me, I think is a huge thing that we always need to be uh, be mindful of is let's not only chase our next certification, but let's also gain real world experience. But it was actually my age that kind of limited how fast I could begin to progress. So I see it as a blessing and a curse. I was young, I was enthusiastic, and that kind of made me just continue diving without chasing cards. But I was also one of those where I was like, okay, what's the next thing? What's my next class? So, okay, I want to do my night diver. I want to do my enriched air night drops. I want to take my rescue class. I want to look at DPVs. I want to look into dry suit diving. So along the way, there were certain things that said, right, now you're just going to go diving. And then when I either hit an age or I was able to actually progress along the career path, then it was, okay, what's the class that I can take now? So <laughs> I was kind of, once again, forced into a, into this little uh career path. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and I started a little bit later in life. Um, not, not as early as you, uh, I, like, I think my first, I think I was like 31, 32 at the time. And one of the things that I, I did have some friends that, you know, as soon as they hit that open water class, they're, they're gung ho and they're going. And there was a part of me that almost used to be, I, I look back on it now and, and I think it was, it was really good how it ended up because I wasn't always able to go into that next course. If I would have had the money 100%, I would have signed up for that next course right after, you know, I completed a course, but I usually had to wait just like, okay, let me save up a little bit of money, go into that next course. Oh, I have all these other things that I wanted to do. And, um, you know, it, everybody's progression is different. And some people, um, I, I, my first dive was in 2016 
And then I became a dive master in 2018 and then an instructor in 2020. So it's a pretty short span of time, but you know, I have, I know plenty of people, I'm sure we all do who from, you know, uh, that first dive to instructor was like a a year or something, you know, the, the, the traditional industry recreational route, you know? So, but the, the, my path that it took me, it kind of, gave me time to go out and do some dives. And I really enjoy like looking back on it, it it really opened my eyes to different aspects of diving. And then, you know, just this pat, well, probably like two years ago is when I started to kind of like, okay, let me look at this, this technical side of things. And and oddly enough, I, I tell people, a lot of people will gravitate towards a backplate and wing because of technical diving. And, and literally the reason why I did it was because I was really big on traveling and I'm like, okay, well, what's the most streamlined way to do things? And then, you know, here comes the back plate and wing. And then I'm like, oh, okay, this, this whole kind of opened my eyes to the technical scene. So I guess leading into my next question, when you started going down that technical path, did you already kind of have a technical foundation or was it a complete learning curve going from you know, the, the traditional recreational now I'm, I'm trying to go into the technical side of things. Oh yeah. For me, there was a most definitely a learning curve. So I had been traditional BCD for upwards of like, Oh, how many dives now? Like 120, maybe 150 dives. So then getting introduced to your back plate and wing, it was a new piece of kit that you add to your arsenal. Then you could start seeing the the benefits or maybe some of the drawbacks that kind of come with the uh, equipment uh, configuration. So I like the simplicity of it. And I also liked how easy it was to transfer to, you know, your diving. As you say, with traveling, moving with the BC, it can be a little bit more cumbersome. When you have a backplate and wing or, you know, a few different wings to kind of go with that backplate, it does make traveling a hell of a lot easier because you say, right, what is the diving that I'm aiming to go do in this location? Right. What is the lift that I need? If you are privileged enough to have uh, a few different backplates, then you can kind of cut down on luggage there. So I uh, I really gravitate to do it quite heavily. Um, and I like the versatility of it. I mean, you know, you move it from your standard mono single sets um diving rig then you move it to your twin set then you move it to your ccr so it's nice being able to have one kind of piece of equipment that then can be translated onto so many different configuration types so i'm i'm really sold on the backplane wing now i think it's most definitely becoming more more seen and sought after in the uh, in the industry and i think that's just kind of moving with you know the evolution of the sport if we look at what we initially started diving with with the albjs and we had the uh the j valves Now we start looking at how far we've come from when we started seeing the sport become more open to the uh, the civilian market. I think it's just going through that natural progression and we're seeing the benefits to it. So I did have a a fun time transitioning, but now I'm in, I'm entirely sold. I would always advocate to definitely try a backplate and wing and see how much it actually helps improves and makes your diving a lot more enjoyable. That's my own personal take on it. Definitely. Uh, and the, the same for me too. So I, I moved to Malaysia about a year and a half ago. And since I moved here, I actually kind of had to take a step back from teaching, which, you know, in, in retrospect was a really good thing because I've been able to further my own education and then kind of formulate a plan on when I finally do get back into teaching. And that was a huge thing for me is, um, you know, smaller classes, but I want to teach in a back plate and wing just because I, I I really do think it's the better piece of equipment because of the fact that you can it can progress with you. So say like, oh, okay, I'll have that smaller wing. I can have that travel wing. Oh, okay, now I want to go to doubles. I just need to swap out the wing. I don't need to buy this whole new kit, right? And I am definitely 100% a huge, huge fan of the back plate and wing now. And uh, no, I, I, yeah, I completely, completely agree with what you said. So my, my next question, I guess, would be when you were transitioning into the doubles, was it something that you just wanted to try or were you uh, like chasing after what, like, like, how did you get introduced to it? And, and then like, what prompted you to want to do it? Okay, so how I got introduced to it was I was sort of being mentored by um, two TITs for SSI, so technical instructor trainers. 
Um, and I remember it was maybe within the first three weeks of me taking my dive master intern that I saw them come balling through the shop. So stages, um, dry suits, doubles. And I was like, oh, that's seriously awesome looking. And I was like, that is something that I really want to now look at. It was that new next progression level. So I think it's like the the level of fascination that comes with the territory. I was told, right, let's get you as an open water instructor. And then we can now start introducing you into this new area of diving. So I had to be patient with it. And I was kind of um, having to grit and bite my teeth because I'm like, I really want to try something new. So a huge part of it was it was just natural progression for me. I saw something new and shiny and I was like, that is the coolest thing I've seen so far. I really want to try it out. And then I think they wanted me to kind of also progress with them. I mean, I think it's good if you want to start seeing the technical market and your dive center grow, you have to expose them to it. And the best way of doing that is also potentially having more and more technical divers or potential instructors that are kind of moving through uh, through your dive center. So they were quite encouraging with that as well. So they got me in the pool. Um, we tried it out. They tuitioned me and educated me and we then finally come around to our uh, lower season, started putting me um, into classes. We started formulating the training and that was it. I was then able to start diving the wrecks that I already loved and had explored, but for a much longer time. And then you get introduced into uh, decompression and that was it. It was right. I, I'm really sold on this. I'm really, really loving this. And I just wanted to gain more exper- experience and more exposure to it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, real quick, the, the place that you were doing your dive master, uh, 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 where was this again? So this was in the, uh, South of the UK, um, in Newquay, Cornwall. So we call it like a little bit of a wreck haven. I think, let's see, within 15 miles of the dive center, we were like three minutes from the beach. We had upwards of maybe 40 different wrecks, some known and explored, some unexplored that we could go out and dive. So it was always, we had what we call the bread and butters. So the ones that we dive on a day-to-day basis and we kind of swap them around. Uh, And then we had the ones that were marked, but hadn't really been explored and really documented that when we had a little bit of downtime, we would grab our twins, our stages, and off we go, we'd go and explore them. So that way we had more and more of a uh, playground for us and our divers to go and explore. Some of the wrecks I have dived to no end, but I'm always happy to literally jump straight back on the boat and get out there. Um, One of the closest ones that we had was like two miles from our our center. So it was a easy seven, 10 minute boat journey out there. So we would dive that pretty much dive out of the water it was uh it was always engulfed in divers and it was fantastic we absolutely loved it it's a it's a beautiful ship she's still intact two huge uh, boilers on it yeah it was i think it was just having that at your fingertips and knowing that you then had the tools in the dive center that allowed you to go and explore it it was you know two things come together and you know it's then achievable yeah yeah so two two questions um the the first question is what what are the typical diving conditions like there and then my second question is why is why is there so many wrecks conditions in the uk they can drastically vary uh the best i've had it is 19 degrees and that's degrees celsius and upwards of maybe 18 19 meters visibility that is the greatest I've ever seen it there. And uh, the worst I've ever had is four degrees and I can't see my hand in front of my face. So it's really two, two huge parallels um, and you experience each side on the spectrum. But what I really liked is it gave me a chance to experience the absolute best of UK diving and also some of the harshest conditions you can potentially comfortably dive in. So I think that range of conditions that I was exposed to also prepared me for, you know, diving over in Truck Lagoon or Southeast Asia where you get these immaculate conditions, but then also going elsewhere where you're kind of slapped in the face with terrible visibility, cold water, and you have to, you have to find a way to manage it and also um, still conduct dives in the safest possible manner. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that is pretty, uh, amazing. Cause you, since you have such a, a big variety, it does really prep you for a lot of different terrain, I should say, just because 
Uh, so we're, you know, I, my first dive I ever did was in, in Thailand, you know, just beautiful blue water, great visibility, and then went back to Texas and the bulk of my training bulk of my diving, even to this day, I should say is in a low visibility freshwater lake. And it is not the greatest place, but there was so many great aspects about it. It was a, it was a big, deep lake. And visibility would either be really horrible or sometimes, you know, on, on a really good day, you could probably get like 15 meters of visibility. And that was like an extremely good, rare day. But it really taught you how to be comfortable in those conditions. And then when you go into that clear blue water, it's 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 like taking a warm bath. You know, you're like, oh, this is absolutely amazing. And uh And then also too, we, you know, no matter what time of year, and I'm sure it's the same where you're at, no matter what time of year, we'd always hit the, there'd be a thermocline. So, you know, it it would get deeper as the summer progressed, but then as the winter uh, would come along, it would get a little bit shallower. So um, you always had to be prepared for it. And it wasn't just like, okay, we're going to jump right in there and it's going to be super mellow. It's like, oh, as soon as we hit 10 meters, we're going to hit a thermocline, 40, uh, 20 meters thermocline. So no, it's it's that I, I really do believe that that type of diving really preps you and hones your skills to be able to move on and get really, really good. Because I, I would tell people all the time, like I'll take a, a, a 30 meter day in Lake Travis over somebody, you know, a 30 meter diver in Lake Travis in Austin, Texas over someone that has just dived blue ocean their whole time. Right. Because they're not going to know what to do when they hit that low visibility in that. It wasn't freezing cold, but it was it was pretty cold water. Yeah, it was cold enough to make a big difference. But one, I find this part and parcel of the fun. I mean, you know, week to week, it's always going to change. And it's always that you get there, you evaluate the conditions, you kind of see what is presented to you at the point in time. And you learn how to manage it while still engaging in a sport that you absolutely love. And I think it, yeah, it definitely prepares you for the diversity of conditions that you experience around the world. I mean, not everywhere is going to have the same environment as what you have over in Thailand. So if you're only diving there, you're kind of limited to exposure. So you don't have the chance to kind of go out and once again, gain that experience in, you know, different, uh, different environments and the challenges they present to your diving. So I think it's really helpful for divers to have the diversity in, um, in locations that they dive. But I actually find it quite enjoyable as well. So, you know, when you turn up and it's easily gin clear 20 meters visibility, you're like, yeah, we're in for a winner, guys. Like, let's go and absolutely love this dive. And then when you go back to 10 days later and you go, right, the visibility is absolutely shot and we don't know what we're going to see. It's, well, let's still go in because you know it's going to be a laugh and you know it's going to be fun. But you, you take the good with the bad. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, so what about the the shipwrecks? Why is there there's so many shipwrecks there? Okay, so the reason why we have so many shipwrecks there is uh, purely from the First and the Second World War. So we've got one of our creme de la creme, as we like to call it, is a German U-boat uh, called the 1021. Uh, that lies 11 meters off the coast um, at a depth of about 55 meters. Um, we've got other wrecks such as the War Baron, the Pier Gint, the depth barges that they use to kind of uh, use to detect um, submarines in the uh, local area. So it's purely the wars that have kind of allowed them to lay at rest. Um, Some, unfortunately, did get taken by severe weather conditions. The Syracuse that I was saying about, that is at 32 metres, and that was moving coal, um, and it was a German cargo ship that sunk in 1876, if I'm not mistaken. And that, unfortunately, just went down to a really bad swell and heavy uh, heavy storm conditions so majority of them are purely from the wars but there are some other little wrecks or other wrecks that are there purely just where they they weren't able to uh manage trekking through the waters when there was a big storm blowing oh awesome awesome yeah and 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 oddly enough i mean i guess it's not odd but um i i feel like a lot of divers that i've met from the uk uh if they kind of came up in that area diving they're they're huge wreck fanatics you know they really love the wrecks and um or or as they would say like they they want rust they want to see rust you know so no that's that's cool i i i I mean maybe i've heard it but as of right now like as we're speaking i'm like oh that's that's cool because i i don't think i 
recollect it or have heard that before. So, well, I know that there's obviously, you know, wrecks from the war, but not in that specific area. Oh, yeah. The uh, the Battle of Britain, uh, we've got loads on the um, Dover coastline. So the beautiful thing about being in such a tiny little, well, once fortified island is everything outside of the perimeter. Uh, there's always there's always a little bit of rust down for you uh, to go and explore and see. So I think, you know, we kind of always have to look back on our history and then that kind of gauges what you're potentially going to find around the coastline. Uh, you never know what new things are going to be discovered or uncovered really we're still trying to go out plot and chart for new undiscovered or undocumented wrecks so we uh we do work quite closely with the fishermen wherever they get their nets tangled or wherever they kind of see a blip on their sonar if you're having a a nice drink at a pub and you kind of run into one of them you can always have a a little conversation they've probably got a little story to tell of oh yeah we think something's here and maybe we can organize you to go dive it and see what we uncover it's it's real good fun but i think that's you know, that's another beautiful thing that, you know, has kept me in diving is that uh, sense of exploration and that want to kind of go and see more and more things. We are so heavily, you know, enwrapped and um, gifted with our uh, rich history. So it's nice being able to go out there and actually see it preserved in um, a timeless state to see it as its final moments float in just before it crashed into the bottom. That's one of those things that really, really kind of gets me excited and really makes me want to go, right, let me grab my stuff. Let's go. So <laughs> uh, having it on your doorstep just really made it um, such a, a choice place for diving. I think that's what kind of kept me in the UK for such a long time and still keeps me coming back wanting to dive. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we um, so we have like there were a few more wrecks off of the east coast of peninsular Malaysia. And and I, I think there are a few more out there, maybe undiscovered, but um, I know pretty recently they've basically been salvaged because a lot of people will go after the metal. Um, like these big, just Chinese ships will come in and, and, um, and, and there was a pretty bad one. It was like probably late last year or earlier this year where, you know, they kind of caught a ship basically just sinking down, not sinking down, but just pulling metal off of the bottom. And then they were going to, you know, somewhere on land and just dumping and there's like bones popping out and everything. And um, it, it's quite sad because it is this big part of history. And then they'll just come in and, and basically just salvage it for the metal, which I had a conversation with someone. They were telling me why they were salvaging it for the metal. Uh, but it's just, it's, it's a sad thing. There's still a couple out there but I know, I feel like they're probably, or I know there used to be more and it, they're kind of getting just not even lost to the mother nature or anything. It's just people coming in and basically like ripping those things up out of the ground. Yeah, it's, it's always a sad one. Uh, one, it takes another thing for us to go and explore out the water. So it is detrimental to what we want to go and do. But when you're disturbing history and when you're disturbing something that actually has a huge story behind it, you're, you, you kind of masking it, you're covering it up. Um, I can understand wanting to salvage it for, you know, repurposing, but I think leaving it where it lies and really immersing yourself in what you're seeing, I think gives it a uh, much greater value and much greater purpose. We can kind of reflect back on it and say, wow, this was a time where the world was so set on tearing itself apart let's kind of look at it let's learn from it let's you know continue to you know see what it's trying to educate us or teach us i know it does happen i don't believe it really happens too much in the uk i think it's quite heavily protected by um uh, mao regulations and other things that i'm not hugely educated on it's just always sad when you're hearing that this is kind of taking place but unfortunately some people only see it as like a rusty bit of money sat at the bottom of the ocean they know that they can do something with it others look at it and say wow that is a piece of history that should be left uh, being untouched um especially when you think of some of them are literally the final resting places for some unfortunate souls so i would uh, i would always gravitate away from taking anything from there especially if you're trying to take the entire <laughs> the entire wreck itself i'm like no <laughs> leave that be please yeah no no for sure so i just have a a, a question for you for my my own personal inquiry um so doing a lot of the type of diving that you're doing i'm assuming that you've probably are pretty familiar with dry suits or you probably got into a dry suit pretty early on um because right now i'm currently in the market for a new dry suit what dry suit do you dive 
So currently I'm diving a trilaminate Rofos 450. Um, this is a relatively small Italian brand that I stumbled across. I've played around with a few different dry suits. I've uh, had Santis, Otters, Fourth Elements. And for me, they're a work uniform. I'm only going to get so many years of diving out of them before they really start showing a lot of wear and tear. I'm a big fan on the Trilams. Um, I like the fact that they don't have any um, degree of compression when you're looking at neoprene suits at depth. I was maybe 40 dives in before I then transitioned over into dry suit diving. So I, I'd like to say I do have quite a lot of experience uh, with them. I've also educated and uh, got myself involved into fixing and repairing them. So socks, seals, I can dabble in zips. I'm not like overly fond of toying with zips, but I've began to kind of really, uh, really understand their, uh, their construction, how they're built and, you know, some of the areas that they're always going to struggle with. Um, you're always going to get stress points on the suit. There's always going to be small holes that you puncture. But I love dry suit diving. I like the redundancy it gives me. I like the... Um, comfort that I experience from them I like the fact that when I'm doing you know long exposure dives they really kind of insulate and protect me from the environment I would always advocate if the environment dictates or if your diamond dictates that you should uh, preferably have one I definitely give it a go um, I love my dry suit to absolute bits I do know Rofos um, I because uh, there's a Fathom rebreathers, they sell them on their website. And I believe one of my friends ended up getting one of them. And um, I kind of forgot about them. And then someone re-reminded me of them a few days ago when I was kind of putting the word out like, hey, what are your thoughts on dry suits? And then uh, so my my game plan was I'm like, OK, I'm just going to I'm going to email 10 different dry suit companies because obviously dry suits, it's, it's not a small expense, right? It's kind of a big expense. And it's like, okay, I'm going to email 10 different companies and then I'm just going to see which companies I get the best customer service from just in case something happens with the dry suit and I need to return it. I want to know that I can talk to somebody and it's not just like I'm, I'm just sending emails out into the darkness. I, uh, I, I ended up uh, connecting with one company. They, I mean, literally emailed me right back. I've heard phenomenal. I don't think I've found one bad review. I've been looking and the fact that the they emailed me really quick, the customer service. So um, I think I might go with them. Have you heard of uh, SF Tech? I have heard of SF Tech. I too have only heard amazing things from them. I understand the suits to be near enough bulletproof. So if you are able to get your hands on one of those, I think you're going to have uh, many, many dry dives and <laughs> really enjoy your time <laughs> diving that suit. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people rock up in them and they look, excuse my French, but they look the absolute nuts. They, um, they look really, really hard wearing. They look super, super comfortable. And I know that they are designed with, you know, very heavy duty demanding divers in mind so i don't think you can go wrong with an sf tech yeah see now, now there's another another one to add to my book of good reviews because i literally was just like okay you know i you know there's the the santis the sf techs the dui um uh avatar just all these different Ursuit, otter all these different companies and i'm like man this is a really tough decision and, you know, I, I literally emailed all these companies to see which one would have the best reception. And yeah, SF Tech, I mean, literally got back to me. I've been just actively speaking to them, which is always nice from a consumer standpoint, because, mm. you know, it, it's just nice to know that like, hey, if uh, if something breaks and I need to send it in for, for whatever reason, maintenance, you know, get something refurbished on it, it's it's not like you know, you'll never hear from the company again. And it's just like, oh, okay, there's, you know, a few thousand dollars just down the drain. Yeah, like you say, it's a huge investment. So whenever you're actually in the market for buying a new suit, you know, you're going to really want to go for the uh, the best possible choice for you. I think we've hit a, almost like a plateau where there's so many amazing and incredibly designed suits out there that you're unlikely to go wrong but I think customer service really kind of stands alone in uh, in some manufacturers. It's it's very easy to become brand loyal, um, and you know have your dedicated I like this because of whatever reasons they may be. But I really think that it's hard to choose a a bad dry suit now. I think so many of them are well constructed and really built for what we we want them to um to be utilized for. So I think 
if you went for any other suit, you'd also be just as happy. But I can totally, totally respect people saying I went for this for this reason. So I think we're kind of at that point where it's it's like choosing between an Audi, a Mercedes, a BMW. It's like, okay, they've all got their features and their functions. They've all got their really like cool little quirks. But are you really going to be disappointed with whatever car you jump into? No. I think that's where we're kind of at with uh, a lot of drafts and manufacturers today. Okay, cool, cool. No, that's 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 good to hear because there is there there are very many choices out there. So my my next question I wanted to ask you is uh, GUE. How did you gravitate towards them? I mean, it seems uh, uh, like a pretty simple answer as we're talking. But so you are a GUE instructor. How did you decide? Why did you decide to go down that path? Okay, so. I have to take a little bit of time to think how I'm going to tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> take as much time as you need. So I was introduced to GUE when I was uh, cave diving in Mexico. Uh, and I was with two friends, colleagues, and um, one of them was a, a, a GUE uh, fundamentals instructor. So we're off dive and we're having a great time. And at the end of every dive, he's always given me an element of feedback. You could have done this better. You could have proved in here. You could have maybe made this easier for yourself. And I'm there going, okay, so I've got this individual telling me this. And then the other individual kind of just giving me high fives, pats on the back saying, yeah, you're absolutely bossing it, mate. You're doing really well. Absolute awesome dive. And I'm thinking, okay, so why is this guy always giving me feedback? And this guy is just kind of singing my prayers. So I started having a bit of a sit down chat with him, as you do at the end of most dives. And he then started giving me more well orchestrated answers into why he was giving me feedback and why he was always assisting me in improving my diving as we're, as we're continuing our, our trip through Mexico. And that then really kind of made me go, right, this person here, it's not only he wants to go diving, but he also wants to see everyone reach their potential. So it then maybe go down this route of well, maybe I should like dive into GUE a little bit more. Maybe I should actually see what the organization is about. So I ended up working for a dive center over in Greece, shout out Scuba Life. And he is a, a, a GUE instructor himself. So he said, look, let's do your fundies. We'll get a class together. And that was it. There were things that I was introduced to in that course where I was like, why has this never been told to me before? Why have I never been introduced to this way of thinking or this way of planning my dives or even just this fine tuning and meticulous assessment of my um, my ability in the water? And that was it. A new door opened and I was straight for it. I was like, okay, this is some cool stuff. They're like, you know, really, um, really set on bringing everyone up to a really fine level of diving. So I took my fundies and then it was my uh, tech one, and then it was my CCR one. And I was so obsessed with their way of teaching and their way of kind of conducting dives that I said, this is something that's really, really opening my eyes. And then it allowed me to actually start working in some project style diving that they were they were conducting. So I got exposed to the agency more. I started speaking with more and more instructors and more and more dive. And I saw them all coming in with this, you know, beautiful happy demeanor and you know bright side of mentality but always in the water they worked in such great unison they were so well planned and thorough with whatever task was happening I was like these guys just it's almost like they're sharing a brain I don't know what's going on here but I would really like to be a part of this so I reached out to a couple of previous um instructors that I had taken classes with and they directed me to um, Dorota who I emailed and said look I'm really interested in actually being a GUE instructor I'd like to improve in my uh, all-round teaching ability I'd like to educate myself further in the industry and the agency and I really think that this is a style of diving that aligns with what I I want to do and what I believe in so I was invited onto the ITC and for the first four days, me and all the candidates looked at each other up and down the table and went, do we actually know what we're doing? Because it was, it, it, it's really interesting how they do things. It's, you know, where there are good points, they kind of cover it very briefly. And then they really aid and assist you in saying, look, these are maybe the points or the areas where we can improve in the best way or in the most. So let's really 
hone in on this. So it was like you're always receiving this um, constructive feedback and uh, trying to elevate you in the areas where you're maybe not performing as greatly. And coming to the end of it, there was like a nice um, one-to-one personal uh, debrief and overview of how the course went. They then told me where I kind of need to maybe um, bring myself up a little bit more. And I liked it. It was it, it was let's cut the crap. Let's tell you exactly where you are and where you need to kind of uh, improve. So I worked at it and I like having goals that I set myself to achieve. And I like knowing that even myself with the so, uh, so many years of experience I have or the exposure that I've had, I, I'm still learning. I've still got something new to kind of, you know, add to my list of growing achievements. So I then organized uh, after getting all my signatures uh, with an IE, I then took my IE and apparently I was, uh, I was good enough and uh, conducted the class well enough where they were like, yeah, okay, you've got this man, get teaching. So they sent me off on my merry way with a, a pat on the back. They told me, keep working at it, keep striving for, uh, for your goals and welcome to, <laughs> to, to GUE. Um, and I love it. I absolutely love this agency. I love what it stands for. I will always sit there and say, there's something for everyone out there. And I just so happen to have found this. I will never sit there and say it's the be all and end all and it's the greatest. It's just something that I really, really like. And I can say it aligns with my my diving. Okay. No, no, I, I like that because some of those points I, I absolutely agree with. Because So I, I am very recent. Obviously, I've known of the, the agency for quite a while, but I'm very recent fundamentals student as of like two months ago and definitely just those eye-opening moments where i i was literally just dumbfounded like why am i just learning this now you know (laughs) i i know that i'm i still have ways to go but i'm just like why why am i just learning this now you know it yeah it was quite funny it, it is. It's those little tips and tricks or those little, um, as we call like GUE estimates, where you're like, wow, that really makes my diving so easy. And I've been doing it in the most like silliest and confusing way possible for so many years. Like, and it's almost like you just hold your head in your hand. You go, why has this never been shown to me before? It's so useful in my diving. Um, and it made me laugh to no end. I'm like, oh, wow, I've been teaching and I've been, you know, thinking that I was doing it in a very, very productive way. And now this is kind of like turned up at my desk and it was like, yeah, you could have been doing it a lot easier for a lot longer. <laughs> you know, oh, great. Cheers. Cool. Okay. I'll, I'll start using this tool. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And so the, the, the final part of the IE, you actually, if I'm correct, you have to teach a class on your own, but under direct supervision of an IT. Is that, is that how they, what, is that their term? Is that correct? Okay. Um, so what you've got an instructor trainer and a instructor evaluator. So you've got your IT and your IE. Now the, uh, GUE process to becoming a instructor is you, um, you basically oversee a class being taught and they prefer it being done by an IE or an IT. And then you enroll in your ITC and there's now a two step signature verification process. So you've got one set of signatures. If I counted them, I think they're for everything maybe upwards of 60 different signatures. So you have to have scored at least a pass or above in all uh, categories on your first signature side. And then once you've got all of those complete, then you can try and organize a class, get an instructor evaluator in, and then they watch you run the class from start to finish. And they then mark you on, again, all of the signatures that you have already got to say, congratulations, you know this well enough where we can trust you to go off and continue teaching without direct supervision. So rather than um, like a traditional um, IDC or ITC through um, for other agencies where it's like a 10 day lead up and then like a two day evaluation, what they say is you need to get all these signatures and then you need to get them all again. So you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's like, okay, cool. And I, I really enjoyed the process. I mean, was it easy? No, but coming off the back end of it, it was so fulfilling and something that really made me go, wow, I'm on a, I'm on a new path. I'm yet to discover new things and be 
exposed to another wonderful world of diving. So I had a great time doing it. It was definitely a roller coaster, but I've now made some really, really great friends through kind of doing that as we all do in diving. I've got some really cool colleagues that I get to network with. You know, some of them, I think that you've even had them on the podcast. I, I've really found that GUE is this sort of like tight knit family and that again, I really, really love about the agency. It's uh, we've just had our conference over in uh, High Springs, Florida, and that was just one great experience to kind of be a part of. I I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of that. That was that was a huge amount of fun. Cool, cool. So when you're teaching the class, I'm assuming they're starting you out. I don't want to say lower level courses, but is it just like you're going to teach a fundamentals course or? You know, because I'm, I'm, I would assume they're not just throwing you into a, a tech one or, or a tech two or a cave one, or are they? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. So um, if you're going to uh, get in teaching, you have to be the level above of what you want to teach. So if you want to start teaching fundies, you have to be a tech one. If you want to be a tech one, you have to have your tech two or your tech two plus. So they always want you to be one level above of whatever you want to teach. So I had. Uh, what we call modules, which other, other agencies would call chapters. It's basically mod, uh, modular one through six. I would have already given the presentations multiple times over. So I would hope to have known them pretty well off by heart. And they say, right, we'll sit down. This is kind of what we are looking for. You're going to take full control of the class. You're going to be looked at on time management, safety in the water, control, you know, how you deliver the presentations, how you improve the student's ability. And they look at encompassing everything that they want from the instructor and you're evaluated all the way through. So if you ever have the instructor that steps in, it's not an immediate fail. It's just, okay, there may have been something here that you missed that I felt was crucially important, or there may be a moment where I need to kind of aid the class in, you know, picking up with time. So the IE does work with you. They don't just kind of sit in the corner, you know, with a death stem and a little tick chart, <laughs> you know, really frying you off track. They are really, really helpful throughout the process. But they're also not afraid if they really think that the class isn't developing or moving as it needs to get involved and say, look, I'm going to take over from here. Um, unfortunately, you haven't passed this time round, but we now know the areas that we need to look at and we can work together to you know, improve for the next class and then you kind of organize the second class and away you go with it. So as much as they kind of do hang over your shoulder and kind of throw you off a little bit, I suppose, maybe that's a bad word to put it, but they kind of are there and it is a little bit nerve wracking. They're also really supportive in helping you develop and become the best diving educator that you are striving to be. So I, I really enjoyed the process. I think it was a, a different experience, but I could really see the value in why they do what they do. No, that's that's awesome. And yeah, because I, I really, really enjoyed my course uh, to the point where, um, you know, I, I opened up communication with my instructor just to kind of because I was curious to like, oh, what's the process of, of becoming an instructor for something like this? And um, and then also just it, it kind of piqued my interest in wanting to further my own further my education within the agency and just kind of see like okay what's that what's this next course and um the the biggest reason i mean there's a lot of different reasons why i I, i've wanted to take a fundamentals course for quite a while i think as a diver you hear about fundamentals it's kind of like you know can i cut the mustard going in can i can i pass this this holy grail of classes right and then also uh, another big reason why we ended up taking it i took it with my girlfriend who just became a diver earlier this year and you know me kind of further along the path i i've known of gue and i was like hey we should go take this fundamentals course together because you and me are going to be diving a lot um, you're newer. I, I feel that you will pick up a lot of good skills and learn a lot of good things. But the biggest thing is me and you are diving together. It'll it'll create a better team situation to where, you know, I'm comfortable with you in the water. You're comfortable with me in the water. We're both comfortable in case something happens, you know. Um, so that, that was a huge reason. And so my girlfriend went into the course, I think, with like, 25 30 dives and she thoroughly enjoyed it and 
the course was like literally even for both of us, I would say like just night and day from when mm. we went in there, I, I literally felt like I'm like, man, I have a pretty good skill set. But even walking out of that course, I was like, I can see and feel the improvement, you know, even with her, she yeah. was saying the same thing. So I think we always need to look back and say, right, where did GUE originate from? And it was all project based diving. So they wanted, you know, unison in the team. They didn't want any hiccups or any confusion. It, they wanted it to run so well so they could have successful projects. So introducing that into the diving mentality is a bit difficult when you've got, you know, small discrepancies in how skills are performed or, you know, how some things are just a tick box exercise. It's okay. Can you clear a mask? Yeah. Well, how comfortably can you clear the mask? Are you doing the step-by-step pro, um, procedures to kind of get in there in the most efficient way possible? So the entire idea about the fundamentals program is to really look at your all-round diving ability and almost fine-tune it. It's not to say you can't dive. It's we know that we could improve here. The best thing that I got told is it's like diving with your best friend and you want your friend to be the best diver possible. So what are you going to do? Are you going to give them a high five and a pat on the back at every skill they do because some are going to be better than others and some are going to need a little bit of work so if it's your friend and you really want them to have a successful you know dive or even career in diving you're going to say oh this was pretty good but this is where we can improve it and that's what i found and that's what i really liked it was there's always areas that we can improve and there's always ways that we can you know become better in diving so let's really try and bring everyone up and reach the, you know, reach our potential because it then aids us in safety in diving. It keeps control in diving. It allows us to explore and, you know, conserve and protect the underwater environment in a better way because we are so free and open with our mind space and we're not overly consumed with what are we needing to do now. If you've got immaculate buoyancy and it's absolutely untouchable you know that you can really control and reposition and adjust yourself in the water without having to really think about what am i needing to do to achieve this it then allows you to take in whatever's in front of you you want to take this cool picture right well your buoyancy is on point you can position yourself to get the best angle okay now you've got the shot that you've really been itching for if you want to look at you know even surveying documenting or just diving wrecks, having certain things in your arsenal and having the ability to really control yourself in the water, just aid you to have a, a more constructive and uh, successful dive without stirring up the sediment or um, the visibility, damaging you or your nice shiny equipment, preserving the wrecks for future divers to come and take a look at. So there's so many things about why that class is there that really help us in our diving. Yeah, the fundamentals is a fantastic class, but I really think we need to be mindful of it's not there just to kind of say this is how we should dive. It's there to say we know that we can be better. Definitely. It, it, it really it really was an eye opening class. And, and a big a big thing that I had going into the class is I ha- actually had a lot of misconceptions going into the course. And, uh, yeah. this is actually one of the things that I wanted to kind of reach out to some instructors and people within the agency and ask is as an instructor, as someone that's kind of been around the GUE scene for a little bit, what are misconceptions, big misconceptions that you see that people have coming into a course, or maybe they don't want to take the course or they're hesitant because they they might have this idea because I, I definitely had a few and a lot of them, if not all of them, were completely just blown out of the water. Like, holy cow, why did I ever think this in the first place? So w- what are some misconceptions that you will come across when people approach you or about just one misconceptions that you will come across? OK, so one of the biggest ones we have is GUE is only technical. So GUE isn't only technical. What we say is we use the tool for the job. So if the tool for the job is a single cylinder, take a single cylinder. There's no reason to overload yourself with all this cumbersome equipment just to go and survey eel grass at six meters, which I've been a part of and I've done with a few different divers. If the dive dictates something else, then we now have to start looking at that. So GUE isn't just a technical organization it stemmed from cave diving which is where it has that 
misconception, but it allows us to experience and explore every area of the environment in a very, very uh, conductive way. The second is, I have to be mindful of how I kind of say this, but I suppose, you know, we are the best. We are definitely not the best. Okay. And I am not here to kind of try and sing our songs and praises. What we really can um, say about GUE is our standardized approach to diving really helps us conduct successful projects. So we will not say we are the best at doing something, but what we have is we've developed a system that really works uh, well in the underwater environment. Everyone's got a different way of doing things. That's totally fine. We will, we have an answer for why we do things, but we'll never say, oh, it's because we this is the best way. We just say, because if everyone does it this way, then there's nothing that can trip us up. So um, it could be something as simple as, you know, even uh, long hose deployment. We do it by such a segmented step-by-step approach that it really helps keep control and allows the skill to happen in such a way that there's no way we can really trip ourselves up. So if everyone is basically uniform and does it the same way, then it means in a real world emergency, when it's unfolding and it's stressful and it can be chaotic and things are likely to spiral uncontrollably to no end, we are doing it in such a way that it helps reduce the further complications that can come with it in a stressful environment. So that's a, that's another big con, uh, misconception. We just have a way of doing things, okay? We are not saying it's the best. I think another one is with our gases. So yeah, we have a reason why we use our gases. There are ar- arguments to why some gases are more preferable, but we kind of look at the success through evidence. So if we've had 200,000 successful dives using specific gases, and someone says, oh, well, this one's better. Well, we like to have evidence provided to us and we like to have a large amount of evidence before we start saying, okay, maybe there's other things that we could change or there's areas that we can look into. So we then start taking that into consideration and it gets brought to the um, the board and then they have a big discussion about it and say, right, should we change things? Should we maybe you know, look at reworking or tweaking things to make our diving more successful? But we we, we look at the success of what we've been able to achieve doing it you know, through the um, the GUE system and that holistic approach. And we are always open to change when it comes through and it really shows itself. But there's nothing at the point in time where we like jump onto the, the bandwagon, I suppose, where we say, right, this is a new thing that's coming through the door. So we need to adapt it now. It's like, okay, well, let's give it some time. Let us, you know, actually see how it performs in the water. And now we can start looking at it once it's got a little bit of you know, longevity behind it once it shows its success rate. I think they're they're pretty much the biggest ones. So yeah, we have a way of doing things. It works for us and we completely understand that not everyone's going to, you know, have the same uh, same wish to do it our way. And that's completely fair. Like, you know, diving is a sport open to the masses and everyone's going to find what they want out of it in their own way. If GUE is your way, wonderful. Welcome aboard. Come, come dive with us. If you're not really, you know, feeling the agency or you're not really um, keen on putting down your BC just yet, that's absolutely fine. We've got no problem with that whatsoever. You're still more than welcome to dive with us. No, I, I definitely am very interested. Like I said, I, I, yeah, I took that fundamentals course and it really piqued my interest to be like, hmm, what's, what's next? Well, yeah, man, let me, let me. Uh, throw out, I guess my my final question of the evening. Let you go and enjoy your day. So, being from the area that you are from and the diving that you've gotten into, and you know we kind of touched a little bit on it, the dry suits. What advice would you have for a diver who is about to get into? cold water diving kind of like the the territory of diving that you came up in the territory diving that you're in um what advice would you have for that diver getting into that cold water maybe low visibility environment okay one is uh brace yourself (laughs) because (laughs) that cold water does hit you differently i would say take your time don't you know go go running into it 
straight away you know build up your capacity take your time adapting and uh, you know kind of converting over into it be very open-minded because there's some incredible things that are you know lurking beneath the uh, the icy cold waters wherever you may be it opens up your dive in to uh, all round season hobby so if you are looking at n- not really ever putting down your uh, your mask and your fins then having the ability to kind of dive in uh, so many different conditions or especially in different uh, temperatures of water then it means that you can experience what you love all year round which is a, th- a thing that I really really love don't go for the latest and greatest and the absolute amazing thermo suits that are straight on the market ease your way into it so get some really really good undersuits get something that's really going to um firmly insulate you from the environment really if you get the chance to go explore and try before you buy different suits to see what you really like if you come across a dive center that actually has them for rental i'd definitely give that a go and yeah just t- take your time kind of building into it it's very easy to get ahead of ourselves and kind of go you know, screaming into it and saying, right, this is me now. I've identified as a cold water diver and I'm going to be like this all the way through. Be be mindful and really take your time adjusting to the changes because that's um, that's going to be the key thing. It's different um, problems are going to present themselves at different points in time. Um, and if we go in too headstrong, then we can find that they trip us up a lot more uh, viciously than what we were hopefully um, <laughs> expecting. So yeah, go in with it with a very open mind, keep diving and really go and explore some of the uh, the cool um, icy stuff that is actually uh, out there waiting for you. Words of wisdom right there. Jordan, thank you very, very much for coming on to the podcast today. I really, really appreciate it. This has been absolutely amazing, insightful. And just once again, thank you very much. No problem. My absolute pleasure, Nick. Yeah, I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and uh, I look forward to hearing it. Offcasting, a scuba podcast.